tonight, fallout from an extraordinary move to search a president's home. What the FBI just did was totally unacceptable. What could come next for Donald Trump and his not-so-subtle hints at another run for the White House in 2024? I believed he was going to run before. I'm stronger in my belief now. The worrying signs that an old disease is set for a new comeback. We haven't seen this in, in decades. How the pandemic hurt vaccination rates for polio. And legend, icon, champion. I love playing, but I can't do this forever. Serena Williams plans life after tennis. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. We begin in the United States, where fallout from the FBI's sudden raid on Donald Trump's Florida estate is throwing more fuel onto an already very hot political situation. Now, it's not clear exactly what the agents were looking for. What is clear, the search has infuriated the former president and galvanized both his supporters and his detractors in Washington and even outside his homes in Florida and New York. It's also raising questions about Trump's escalating legal problems and what all of this means for a possible second run at the White House. So far, the U.S. Justice Department is saying very little about all this. But as Katie Simpson shows us, Trump's Republican allies are more than happy to fill in the silence. To Donald Trump's diehard supporters, this is a dark moment in history. We have a witch hunt. You feel like you're, you might be in Venezuela or China or, or Russia or even in Hitler's Germany. A small group gathered near Trump's Florida residence vowing vengeance. It's time for we the people to get off the couch, shut down Netflix, put your phone down, get up, come outside or you're not going to have a country left. The Department of Justice is not commenting on the raid in which FBI agents reportedly removed a dozen boxes of documents from Mar-a-Lago. Trump's allies took advantage of the void of official information, casting their own narrative. This is the government using an agency to spy on a potential opponent's campaign. And this is truly frightening and it is not what our democracy stands for. Trump has a controversial history with sensitive information. Not only did he take 15 boxes of classified documents when he left office, he's also reportedly ripped up and flushed papers down the toilet. If there were sensitive materials at Trump's private club, it could pose a national security risk. You can imagine the kinds of secrets that make their way to the White House and specifically to the desk of the president. Mar-a-Lago has a lot of traffic, including traffic from foreigners and including possible trespassers from foreign intelligence services. Whatever the FBI was looking for, some Republicans say it had better be big. It has to be something of incredible magnitude for at least my side of the aisle to say that was that was warranted. With, without that, I think we're going to find ourselves in a very big mess yeah. as it relates to the credibility of the FBI. We are a nation that is allowed Trump is capitalizing on the moment, fundraising off the raid, and releasing a new ad, furthering speculation he's going to declare himself a presidential candidate. It would give him some cover to dismiss investigations as politically motivated and could blunt any new probes as the attorney general has to personally sign off on any investigation involving a candidate. I believed he was going to run before. I'm stronger in my belief now. Okay, Katie, all the reactions aside, procedurally, where does this investigation go from here? Just because this search took place doesn't mean charges will be laid. It's the fact-finding part of an investigation. But Trump's legal exposure is growing. There are also two separate investigations into efforts to overturn the 2020 election. And a D.C. court ruled he has to give his tax returns to Congress, but he's likely to appeal that one. When you take a step back and look at all of the investigations in Trump's orbit, we've never seen anything like it. All further moves will likely be just as politically explosive. Indeed they will. Katie Simpson in Washington, thank you. Thanks. And sit tight for more on what all this means for Donald Trump legally and politically when I speak with the editor of the New York Post and a former Watergate prosecutor. That is in about 20 minutes. Now, the Saskatoon woman accused of staging her disappearance and that of her son has issued a statement to CBC News from an Oregon jail. Dawn Walker was the subject of an extensive search after she disappeared with her son two weeks ago. 
Walker was arrested in Oregon City Friday. In the statement, she writes, I left Saskatoon because I feared for my safety and that of my son. She does not name who she fears. Walker has been charged in the U.S. with aggravated identity theft. And if she's convicted, that could lead to a minimum prison sentence of two years. Now, hundreds of people in Vancouver face some difficult questions about the future tonight after the city began removing a major tent encampment. The makeshift community had been a fixture in the city's downtown east side for months, but no more. And as residents pack up to go, advocates accuse the city of violating its own promise to help them. Lindsay Duncombe takes us there tonight. On a day of upheaval, the soundtrack comes from a heroin user who taught herself to play. It's sad. It's horrible to see people don't have homes. That there's a piano here shows just how permanent this encampment has become. It's a neighborhood, and they're trying to make the best out of what they've got because of our economy today and the lack of uh, available housing. The B.C. Human Rights Commissioner estimates 400 people live in tents along several blocks of Hastings Street in Vancouver's downtown east side. I don't even know where to start. What do you need to do here? Just pack and move, basically. Melody Watts is putting everything she owns into bins provided by the city. Storage facilities have been arranged, but she has no idea where she will go. Everybody's overwhelmed, I think. The city of Vancouver says moving people will take weeks. The order to move the tents came from the fire chief. The department has responded to more than 1,000 fires since January. The doorways are obviously completely blocked over, so if we do have a small fire in here, um, our crews are going to be delayed even just getting access to inside. Advocates say simply moving people isn't a solution. They want to see more shelters and more housing. To come down and sweep this, you're just going to move it for maybe a day and, and everyone will come back. So, or they'll go somewhere else. So it's not really a solution to the issue. By late afternoon, tensions grew between residents and police. Several people were arrested. It'd be like somebody took coming to your place and taking your house. People don't get it. No one cares. Yeah, so that's a terrible feeling, thinking that no one cares. Lots of people have this question, though. Where are they going to go? And there really is no clear answer for that question, Adrian. BC Housing put out a statement today saying that they simply do not have the number of spaces for the people expected to be displaced by this order. Now, one of the things they want to do is go through and renovate some of the SROs or, or rooming houses to create more available spaces. But a lot of people we spoke to said the reason they moved out to the street and left those rooming houses is because they believe the rooming houses were dangerous and they were too hot. It's a complicated situation. It certainly is. All right, Lindsay Duncombe in Vancouver. Thank you, Lindsay. So some shock for the world's tennis fans. One of the greatest players of all time, Serena Williams, says she's getting ready to leave the game. Jamie Strachan shows us the impact of her legendary career. Serena Williams through to the second round. Few athletes have dominated their sport like Serena Williams. Her latest victory in the first round of the National Bank Open in Toronto, after which the 40-year-old dropped a hint of what was to come. I'm getting closer to the light, so that's... <laughs> yeah, so that's like, lately that's been, that's been it for me. I can't wait to get to that light. Can you, I know you're joking, but can you... I'm not joking. In an essay published the next morning in Vogue, Williams wrote this month's U.S. Open will likely be her final tournament. I never wanted to have to choose between tennis and family. I don't think it's fair, she wrote. If I were a guy, I wouldn't be writing this because I'd be out there playing and winning while my wife was doing the physical labor of expanding our family. I can't do this forever. So it's just like sometimes you just want to try your best to enjoy the moments and do the best that you can. There have been many moments, 73 singles titles, including 23 grand slams and four gold medals. The way that she's been able to win as she has in her career, she is right up there. She, she is the GOAT, she's the best of this era, and she's certainly one of the greatest of all time. Williams' impact on the game is hard to measure. She learned the game from her father on the public courts of Compton, California, alongside her sister, Venus. 
and her combination of power, grace and style made her a role model for athletes everywhere. I grew up watching her. I mean, I, that's the reason why I play tennis and, you know, tennis being a predominantly white sport, it, it definitely helped a lot because um, I saw somebody look like me dominating the game and it made me believe that I could dominate too. Williams has been just as successful off the court, from tennis icon to cultural icon, with countless endorsements. Show them what crazy can do. I'm Venus. I'm Serena. A Hollywood movie about her life, even appearing in a music video for Beyonce. The way that she has become a first name basis, everyone knows who Serena is. Williams will play her second round match Wednesday, a chance for tennis fans in this country to see one of the game's greats in person, possibly for the last time. Jamie Strash in CBC News, Toronto. Amazing athlete. After being rescheduled because of the pandemic, the World Juniors Hockey Championships are back in Edmonton. Welcome back to Edmonton and the summer edition. Let's go. That is the puck dropping today for the first time. Czechia against Slovakia. Teams from all over the world face off over the next 11 days, but thousands of tickets are still unsold. Now off the ice, it's a tumultuous time for Hockey Canada. The organization that oversees all levels of the sport in Canada is facing scandal over its handling of sexual assault allegations. It sparked intense criticism, but as Karen Paul shows us, some of that criticism is trickling down to regional federations. Good morning, Marky. How you In a CBC Radio interview on Monday, the head of Hockey Manitoba defended Hockey Canada. Uh, they've put together a very strong action plan. Uh, they have the right people that uh, are leading this organization that have a great deal of experience. I'm certainly comfortable with the direction that they're going in right now. Earlier this year, news broke of an alleged group sexual assault involving eight hockey players four years ago, including members of Canada's 2018 men's world junior team. What are your thoughts? As In the interview, Wood said the woman this failed to cooperate with uh, the investigation, even though Hockey Canada recently acknowledged that she spoke to police immediately after the alleged assault. Wood's comments exploded on social media, some calling out a toxic culture, others demanding resignations. I mean, come on, read the room. Greg Gilhooley was abused by Graham James when he played junior hockey in Winnipeg. I think that the leadership within hockey has to understand that this issue isn't going away and that simply saying we've got it covered isn't going to fly. Last week, Hockey Quebec sent a letter on behalf of 13 regional hockey federations threatening to withhold fees from Hockey Canada unless it met certain conditions. Since then, the Hockey Canada board chair stepped down, replaced today by board member Andrea Skinner. A former Supreme Court judge was also appointed to do a review. Saskatchewan Hockey is now backing away from those threats, saying we support the action being taken. Abhorrent. This That's advocate sees it as a time of reckoning. I'm hoping over the long run we're going to see more people being held accountable for the harm that they've caused. But this expert isn't convinced. Hockey Canada has been at the source of this problem for decades. The only reason they're cleaning it up now is because finally it came out in a time where people are not prepared to look the other way. Many players are already thinking about the next season and parents are starting to pay hockey registration fees to be seen whether this scandal puts anyone off the sport. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. A major highway will remain open tonight in Newfoundland after being closed for days under threat from wildfires. So Route 360 had been shut down since last Thursday, leaving people in several communities completely cut off. Conditions have been improving after a bit of rain. More supplies are now able to get through. Still, thousands of people are under state of emergency and officials are warning residents to just be cautious. Even though it's a positive day, it's an optimistic day, it's, we're not out of the woods yet uh, and this fire is still very active. Please don't be panicked, but be ready as should an evacuation be required. Out of control fires have been burning now for more than two weeks in the province. One of them is bigger than 20,000 football fields. As Ontario's hospitals groan under the strain of dire staffing shortages, many healthcare workers were watching the province's throne speech very closely today. But as Thomas Dagla shows us, some were disappointed by what unfolded. <laughs> 
on an occasion filled with centuries-old traditions, critics say the government failed to address Ontario's biggest present-day crisis. Your government is actively engaging with health system partners to identify urgent, actionable solutions. This throne speech, delivered on behalf of Premier Doug Ford, largely repeating the themes that just recently won his progressive conservatives a majority. It's the lack of urgency in the policy points that is the most surprising. Since the election, Ontario hospitals have suffered worsening staff shortages, with some emergency departments temporarily closing and others forcing patients to face harrowing waits. In Chantel McNeil's case, 19 hours while in excruciating back pain. It was actually an 8.7 centimeter cancer. Her agony reflects a health care system that some staff say is on the brink of collapse and critics say is overlooked by Ford. The government had a chance to table a new budget to deal with these crises and Doug Ford chose not to. The PC government is again tabling its same spring budget with few updates. This despite repeated demands from health care unions for measures such as improving mental health support for staff, more quickly integrating foreign trained workers and repealing an annual 1% cap on pay hikes. We're not here to bash anyone. We're saying like, let's work together. The finance minister insists Ontario is doing what it can within its means. Responsible fiscal management is needed now more than ever. But Aram Chagala questions the government's approach. They need to come into the hospital and see what's actually going on. She's living the hospital crisis as a registered nurse working in the gravest emergencies. This could cost lives. That's, it's, it's very concerning and very, very scary. So, Thomas, given everything you've just said, what does the government say it's going to do to address the hospital crisis? Well, the Ontario government here at Queen's Park has uh, pointed to numbers repeatedly, and they did again today. They say uh, that they've added more than 3,000 additional hospital beds. They've hired thousands more personal support workers and nurses, but those who've been on the job say that's hardly enough. Now, there was an acknowledgement in today's throne speech that more can be done to address uh, the crisis in health care, but the government is not saying what it might do or when. Adrian. All right, Thomas Degla in Toronto. Thank you. New York health officials are expressing some alarm about a case of polio, and they say there could be hundreds more. The case of polio is concerning because we haven't seen this in, in decades. What we need to be paying attention to. Mr. Trump, can we get your reaction to the raid? Donald Trump compares the FBI search of his Florida home to the break-in at Watergate. So, a former Watergate prosecutor tells us what she thinks. Plus, more on how this is playing out in Republican circles. <laughs> and story after story of chaos at summer festivals. Why some big events are hitting big roadblocks this summer. People were exhausted, dehydrated, standing, waiting for something that's not coming. We're back in two. There are new concerns tonight about an old disease. Polio is an emerging worry for officials south of the border. Lauren Pelly now on what we know so far and what it could mean right here. For maximum protection from paralytic polio. Scenes from history show the wrath the of polio. Children paralyzed for life, others relying on iron lungs months. to breathe. Now the virus is spreading again in parts of New York State. It's showing up in at least two counties' wastewater. One unvaccinated young adult who became infected developed paralysis. The case of polio is concerning because we haven't seen this in, in decades. Uh, many of these infections. But this New York physician says it wasn't a total surprise. Now in the last two years um, with the pandemic, childhood immunization rates have dropped dramatically, um, not only uh, due to anti-vax sentiments, but just due to the fact that people are, were just not getting routine medical care. Health officials are warning hundreds could already be infected without even knowing it. Polio vaccination programs are now underway in New York to get people up to date. If you have asymptomatic carriage of polio, then it can spread. At this pop-up clinic inside a Toronto hotel, Dr. Anna Banerjee vaccinates refugees from Afghanistan, where polio remains a constant threat. 
Global travel means this virus can find its way to anyone who's not yet immunized. In some Canadian provinces, it's estimated more than 10% of toddlers don't have their three rounds of polio shots. If you start not vaccinating the kids from the primary series, like the measles, mumps, rubella, uh, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, polio, etc., then you, you risk those diseases coming back. This was after I came back from the Para Games. Wes Hazlitt says Canadians shouldn't take that risk. The 70-year-old Winnipeg resident caught polio at just 13 months old. He learned to walk with crutches and leg braces. Recently, he spent tens of thousands to make his home accessible. I would not want people to have to go through what my life was and what the uh, current life is for lots of people that had polio a long time ago. His advice for today's Canadian families? Stay up to date on vaccinations. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. After the break, questions tonight about what the FBI retrieved from Donald Trump's home. The U.S. Department of Justice is staying pretty mum. I will get some insights from a former Watergate prosecutor and a Republican writer about how it could all unfold. Next. Tonight, our neighbors to the south are not terribly united in those United States after the unprecedented search of Donald Trump's Florida home. They should not be doing this. This is a disgrace. Completely appropriate. How many crimes can you commit before you're held accountable? What exactly was being sought within the walls of that Mar-a-Lago home is still unclear. As protesters raged, the Department of Justice stayed quiet, leaving everyone to guess what was actually retrieved. For Trump and his allies, it's a political opportunity and an opportunity to fundraise. So this is all obviously messy. We need some clarity here, which is why we have plugged in well-connected analysis tonight. Joe Weinbanks is a former Watergate prosecutor and Kelly Jane Torrance is an editor at the New York Post. So thank you both for joining us tonight. I am... Uh, Fairly sure you both have a lot of questions as well about exactly what is going on. But Jill, I wanted to start with you, if I may. We have heard uh, the former President Trump compare this to the break-in at Watergate. You were a Watergate prosecutor. In how many ways is this not that? It is not that at all because this was a search warrant that was granted to the FBI as a result of establishing probable cause of two things. One, that there was a crime committed, and two, that there was evidence that could be obtained at the location specified in the search warrant. The Watergate break-in were not federal agents. They were people hired by the President's Committee to Re-elect and the White House. They were paid by campaign money to break in illegally into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee to put in illegal wiretapping bugs. And so it was a crime for them to enter. It was not part of our judicial system and part of our law enforcement. Very, very different thing. And there was no evidence that there was any reason to go into the DNC. But if there had been, it couldn't have been done by the burglars. It would have had to be done by law enforcement. So when you, when you talk about a search warrant, I don't think, you know, for people who are sort of history buffs a little bit, you look back on history on this day in the 70s, Richard Nixon leaving office. When you think of Richard Nixon, he, a search warrant wasn't executed on him. There was a subpoena. Why no subpoena in this case? There was cooperation in the beginning. If you remember, 15 cartons of documents that had been illegally removed from the White House, some of which were highly classified, so classified that we don't know exactly even what the level of classification was because the level is classified. So that was obtained by the FBI going there and getting them without a subpoena and without a search warrant. I'm guessing that negotiations broke down and that the former president refused to allow them to take any further documents, but that after a review of the ones that were already removed, the archives identified additional missing documents. 
The other thing is we don't know that only documents, that only violations of the Presidential Records Act are at stake here. So your point about we don't know is, is sort of the salient one here. We can all speculate. And to that end, Kelly Jane, the moment you heard this happen last night, Within Republican circles, what were you hearing in terms of a reaction? What are you still hearing? Yeah, there was, of course, a lot of shock, Adrian. Uh, you know, this is almost unprecedented, having a, a very recent president and possible presidential candidate, of course, in 2024. Uh, but I think this could backfire. Uh, we're already seeing, for example, Donald Trump is sending out fundraising emails, trying to fundraise off this. And uh, I have to say, you know, it's not even just among Republican circles. Uh, even many Democrats are shocked and in some ways dismayed, uh, concerned about this raid. Uh, I can tell you, got, you know, former Governor Andrew Cuomo here in New York, uh, not a Trump fan at all. He actually uh, tweeted out today that DOJ must immediately explain the reason for its raid. And it must be more than a search for inconsequential archives or it will be viewed as a political tactic. So even someone like Andrew Cuomo, who has no love lost for President Donald Trump, uh, he's questioning uh, what happened here in the timing. And so both Republicans and Democrats are, are surprised and really demanding some answers, uh, none of which, of course, we've gotten yet from the DOJ or Attorney General Merrick Garland, who would have had to have signed off on a raid uh, of a former president. So, Kelly Jane, when I hear you talk, it sounds as if Donald Trump and, and his group are saying, oh, actually, this was a good day for us politically, curiously. In some ways, yes, Adrian. Uh, it certainly helps him with the martyr complex that he sometimes uh, likes to go through. But it also shows in some ways, I think, that uh, is there evidence to indict Trump on any actions that he took uh, on or around January 6th? And, I, I think this is a bit of a fishing expedition on the FBI's part. Uh, the Democratic Party and Attorney General Merrick Garland are facing a lot of pressure from the Democratic base to indict Trump. Uh, I think they're looking for something they can use, and I think that shows that they don't have any hard evidence in hand yet to bring down an indictment. But the core, the core implication of what you just said, though, is that this is a politically motivated act. That, that this is not the DOJ, Department of Justice, acting independently, that this is driven by the Democrats in the White House, the White House saying it, it knew nothing of this until it saw it in public reports. So, Jill, I'm wondering, like, how important is it to make that distinction and what next steps do we need to be looking for? So, first of all, there is a clear policy and a good reason for the Department of Justice being different than any other cabinet agency, for the Department of Justice being independent and policy can be set, but no specific targets can be set by anybody in a political position. There should be no coordination, and there isn't any. There was during the Trump era, and that was something that was much complained about. In terms of the fundraising, I don't see that as a good thing. I don't know exactly why they chose to do it at this particular minute, but if there are secret documents that could endanger our national security, still there, that would certainly be a reason. Well, it's, it's certainly extremely messy. Uh, emotions are, are fraught. And, and as you both said, we actually have no idea what they were looking for, so we all need a little bit of patience. Jill Wine-Banks, Kelly Jane Torrance, again, thank you both very, very much. Thanks thank you. Again. After the break, Kenya heads to the polls in a pretty divisive election. I woke up very early to come and vote for my change. I need change. But it is a very different story for young people when they're not even bothering to vote. And the man who helped put Japanese fashion on the global stage. We remember Issei Miyake. <laughs> Influential Japanese fashion designer Issei Miyake has died. The 84-year-old Miyake was well-known around the world for his signature pleated pieces. He also designed the black turtlenecks worn by Apple CEO Steve Jobs almost exclusively for decades. Miyake died last week from liver cancer. A funeral has already been held 
but the news was kept largely private until today. And legendary Motown songwriter Lamont Dozier has also died. The 81-year-old was part of the songwriting team behind hits like You Can't Hurry Love for the Supremes and some classics for Marvin Gaye as well as the Four Tops. The team was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Dozier often said part of his songwriting inspiration came as a kid in Detroit listening to grown-ups talk about love and relationships, the good and the bad, and the lyrics just flow. We are keeping an eye tonight on a very tight presidential race with votes being counted this evening. And the winner has a brutal job ahead, tackling a devastating drought and the soaring cost of living. This is all happening in Kenya. And Katie Nicholson brings us up to speed on the candidates and the concerns. Despite fears of violence, a calm, well-oiled machine. As Kenyans cast their ballots, there are two front runners. First, veteran opposition leader Raila Odinga, nicknamed Baba or Father. We as a country are at inflection point. Surprisingly endorsed by his bitter arch rival, the outgoing president. And then there's William Ruto, the current deputy president. We will overcome. Enough is enough. A self styled upstart who sees himself as the leader of Hustler Nation reportedly stung the soon-to-be former president didn't endorse him. The election may have a soap operatic backstory, but voters have more practical concerns. I woke up very early to come and vote for my change. I need change. I need a better living. Kenya is grappling with a devastating drought and skyrocketing inflation. In the last year, pantry staples like cooking oil up 52%. Maize, 24 percent. We're dying, hunger. So we need to do something for a change. That's why we are voting. At his restaurant, Musonye Muzinga feels the pinch, and so do his customers. We keep on fluctuating the prices, so customers complain. Yesterday it was 10 bob, now it is 15 bob. I have to top up the prices here. He isn't convinced any candidate can fix it and decided not to vote. Kenyan voter turnout is historically high. Emotions have run even higher. But this time, fewer younger voters registered. Signaling, says this professor, leaders need to win them back. It's by doing the right things right and uh, by committing to, to, to what you promised to deliver. You, you cannot promise uh, sunshine and give us darkness. Yet another challenge the winner of this tight race will have to face. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, London. Next on the national festival season is supposed to be in full swing. So why are so many falling off the tracks? It just kept getting worse and worse. No security or no venue or outright last minute cancellations. What is behind the festival turmoil? And maybe a little more Canadian than the log driver's waltz. The Stanley Cup goes for a float down the Bow River. A series of music festivals and public events hit some major roadblocks across Canada this past weekend. So what is going on? Lisa Shing looks at why so many events seem to be struggling. Instead of chanting a musician's name, calls for a refund came from the crowd at a Toronto area festival this weekend. I came from Nunavut. Yeah. We had it planned. We Among thousands at Cultureland Music Festival, like Muta Charamba. After delays on day one, the second day was abruptly moved more than 40 kilometers away. It just kept getting worse and worse. And while attendees waited in the heat, many of the acts never showed up. People were exhausted, dehydrated, standing, waiting for something that's not coming. Organizers apologized and say they're working on refunds. <laughs> At nearby Kingston Music Festival, there were complaints of overcrowding and lack of access to water on a sweltering day. It's unacceptable. Like, you can't be doing that. Like, you should have had plan for like all of these factors to be a thing. We made sure that organizers say they planned for months and locked the bar to prevent looting. Our patrons got too excited to finally see the festival happening. And with that excitement, it caused a breach. 
It's been a tough season. Montreal's Pride Parade was cancelled because organizers never hired security. In BC, flight delays left many of the Base Coast Music Festival's lineup stranded. The world has been so standstill that businesses are out of practice. We're out of practice. After two years of pandemic restrictions, festival organizers are facing a lot of challenges, including rising costs, supply issues with stage equipment, and a shortage of experienced workers. And I think a lot of that is just kind of getting warmed up again. Demand has been high as restrictions eased, but what remains to be seen is if frustrated festival goers are willing to give events like these a second chance next summer. Lisa Sheng, CBC News, Toronto. A sci-fi film looks to the future to make a statement about the history of this country. Set in the year 2043, Night Raiders follows the story of a Cree woman and her fight to reclaim her daughter. Eli Glasner took us behind the scenes last fall. In a forest outside Toronto, Cree warriors prepare to flee from government forces hunting children. Soldiers! Soldiers on the perimeter! Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's fall, years before the pandemic, before discoveries at residential school sites reminded us of what was buried in Canada's past. We're on the set of the movie Night Raiders by Cree Métis director Danis Goulet. Set in the year 2043, the story takes place in a shattered nation. Who lives here? The city went dark after the war. Where the state rips children from their families, forcing them into school. No one can see her face. Goulet says the sci-fi approach gives her more freedom. It um, liberates you as a storyteller to come at things that you want to say. You can be as political as you want, and because you're in a totally fictional mm -hmm. universe, you can say whatever you want to say. And in this near future scenario, the Kree warriors, the Night Raiders, are fighting back. The film is part of something exciting happening with Indigenous movies. Ain't nobody immune here but us. Take the zombie thriller, Blood Quantum. <laughs> or Slashback, an alien invasion movie shot recently in Nunavut. We're on the precipice of a golden age of Indigenous cinema. Mm -hmm. um, these stories are really just starting to get, you know, um, really massive platforms like the film, like our film is. Um, and there's so many stories to be told. Even on this wet, dreary day, you can see how the past and future collide as the teepee does double duty as a video village. Although the story is science fiction, the trauma it unearths is real, so they tread carefully. It involves, you know, uh, approaching things with a lot of sensitivity. So we do smudging on set. We do many things to keep our actors safe because we know they're bringing their lived experience to the set. Fast forward to a month ago, the soggy shoot days replaced with red carpet glamour as the Night Raiders arrive at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. It feels amazing that we have like the Night Raiders um, as our, I guess, our heroes. I think there's a warrior in all of us. How are you feeling right now? You look, you look so like... ecstatic. I'm so excited right now. The morning after the premiere, the director is still buzzing. It was amazing. It was the first time that I'd actually seen it big with an audience, so I was just hanging off of every thing in the movie. But Goulet says they almost didn't get the green light because some broadcasters said what happened wasn't relevant. We got notes back saying that it was a propulsive story with great characters, but they felt that the residential school allegory didn't work because as a country we'd moved on from that. But that changed over the summer. The BC First Nation announces a horrific discovery. The remains of 215 children who attended a residential school. We really haven't grappled with the full truth of what's happening. And I think this summer has been a testament to that with what we've been finding out in the news about the graves of children. So um, we've got a long way to go. The heart of Night Raiders is about a mom fighting for her daughter. Both actors playing those pivotal roles have felt the ripple effects of residential schools. For Brooklyn Latexier Hart, it was her grandmother. When I got to like the age about like 11, 12, she started talking more about um, the trauma she went through. For Elmaya Tailfeathers, her grandfather. I know that he ran away from school too many times to count um, and that it was a really hard experience for him.
As Night Raiders finally opens in theaters, for them it isn't about the pain of the past, but the resilience to move forward. I know that it was our, our culture and um, our ancestors and, and the strength of who we are as a people that kept us alive and, and, and got us through those violent systems. Um, and so, you know, Night Raiders is an allegory. Um, it, it's, it's a physical representation of, of, of that strength. We pledge our hearts and give our allegiance. A vision of the future with a message for the present. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. A different kind of Stanley Cup parade Tuesday night in Calgary. Well, look at that. Crowds came out to the banks of the Bow River to see two members of the NHL champion Colorado Avalanche, Logan O'Connor, and the Norris and Smythe Trophy winner, Kale McCarr, show off the cup with an assist, of course, from the Calgary Fire Department, who gave them the ride. So from stars on skates to some skater kids who are stars in their neighborhood. Good moves, plus some committed kids made this skate park in New Brunswick happen. And I was very happy because I love skateboarding. I just kind of like riding around on the scooter, trying no handers, trying one hander. I can't jump yet, but I can do this. Nice. Nice indeed. These kids on Grandma and Anne are hyped about their brand new skate park, of course. But it's not just the place that is special. It's the story of the people who made that park happen. So the idea started with one enterprising 11-year-old named Cooper from mastermind to lobbyist and fundraiser, the story of his determination and the community that came together is our moment. You said that you were really enjoying skateboarding and your friends were really getting into it, but that you really didn't have anywhere to do it. So he and some friends went to uh, went away for the day to a couple of different skate parks on the mainland. He came back and was kind of lamenting that we didn't have the same thing here and how that felt kind of unfair. Yeah, I can't. We came up with the idea that he would write a letter to the village council. Then the council came back and said that they wanted the kids to raise $10,000 to put towards it, and then they would work towards uh, funding the rest of it. So Cooper wrote another letter sort of um, to hand out to different business owners on the island saying, you know, this is what we're doing. This is why we're raising money. And, and yeah, we had the money really pretty quickly. It didn't take too long to, to drum up $10,000 on, on, the, on the island. Hey, Cooper, good for you. A man of few words, but lots of action. Uh, not only did they raise, obviously, what they needed, but they raised so much more. The kids had another good idea to get enough skateboards that they could then loan out, like a skateboard library, to other kids in the community. Well done, you. That is a national for August the 9th. Good night.